it's really a great pleasure to be here and thank you so much for the invita invitation to, to join you this evening and to, to have the opportunity to talk about the work I'm involved in, which I, which I love and find very inspiring and I hope that you will find it inspiring too. The plan is for me to speak for 20 to 25 minutes or so about that and then for us to have some time for further discussion and for questions and I would be delighted to, to, to have your questions. I am hopefully going to be able to share some slides with you through the wonders of screen sharing. I'll just try to do that now and get that out of the way. Bear with me one moment. Can you see um, what looks like a slideshow? Yes. Excellent. That's great to hear. Thank you. And before I move on, I'll just mention that throughout the slides that I'm using this evening, there's a, there's a thread of artwork um, which has been designed by one of my colleagues, Francesco Piobbiki, who back in 2013 uh, was one of the, the team sent out to Lampedusa. And he used drawing as a way to, I suppose, uh, release some of the tension, some of the anxiety that he felt when he was doing work out there. It was a kind of therapy for him. And he found that he was drawing what he was seeing. And we realized that the drawings that Francesco does actually help us sometimes to tell the story of what's going on uh, around the world and in the Mediterranean in particular. So it's nice to be able to, to show you some of his drawings as we move along. Um, and if at any stage you want me to tell you about them, because they've all got meaning, then I'll be happy to do that. I'd like you just to take a look at this picture for a minute. What do you see? Who do you see? Is this a migrant? A refugee? An asylum seeker? It's not easy to tell. But just imagine for a second that you are this little girl. Maybe your name is Mishti. Imagine your mother is dead and your father, who's a farm labourer, hasn't had any work this year because the crops have failed for lack of rain. Imagine that you, like her, scavenge amongst rubbish for food, for things that you can sell, that you don't have access to running water, that you live in a shack, that you sleep in... On a, on a mattress on the floor. Imagine that you are always hungry. And just imagine if your dad tells you that he's heard that there's a place far away where he might be able to find work and then make you a home and then be able to feed you every day. He tells you that the people there might be kind and welcome you. And so you and he are going to go on a long journey to that place. Does that make you a refugee? We're going to be thinking for the next little while about people on the move. And before we think about some of the consequences of moving from one place to another, I thought it would be helpful just to, to give you some facts and figures. So I had a look and on Monday, the global population stood at about 7.85 billion people. And most of these people will never move more than a few miles from where they were born or, or grew up. But a fair number of us do make a decision to move at some point, either within our own country or to somewhere else. And we do it for all sorts of reasons. Some people chase the sun or in fact the rain. Some people are offered a job somewhere else. Some people fall in love with a place or with a person. But some people move because they are forced to and we call these people forcibly displaced. UNHCR, that's the bit of the UN, the United Nations, that works on behalf of refugees, estimates that at present just under 80 million people 
in the world have been forcibly displaced. That's about one in every hundred people. And forcible displacement isn't a strict legal concept, but it's a term that we can all understand quite easily. It means that the people involved feel that they haven't had a choice in leaving their home. And that might be because there's a, a war, but it could also be something like a natural disaster, a famine or a drought. So that little girl in the picture would be one of those people. And of those 80 million or so who are forcibly displaced, more than half don't actually leave their own country. They simply make a home somewhere else within it. And these people are known as internally displaced people or IDPs. It's the remainder that try their luck somewhere else. However, the thing that might surprise you is to know that not everybody who is forcibly displaced is considered to be a refugee. That's a word with a very strict legal definition. Even although everyone who's forcibly displaced has had to leave their home, only about one third could be described as refugees. You can only be described as a refugee if you've fled your country because you have a well-founded fear of persecution or something similar. And as a result of that, you're unwilling or unable to, to return. So that little girl in the picture might be forcibly displaced, but she wouldn't be classed as a refugee. She doesn't fit the definition, but she's no less desperate. And I just also wanted to quickly mention that other term that we often hear, asylum seeker. These are people who are asking to be given refugee status and the protection that goes with it, but whose claim hasn't yet been decided. Because we hear these terms being bandied about all the time and we don't really give much thought to what they mean. I guess the point that I want to make is that you, you can't tell just by looking at someone why they're on the move or which category, if any, they might fall into. But more importantly, it's worth remembering that it's not just asylum seekers and refugees in that strict definition who are looking for a better life. And I think it's also important to mention that most refugees are not hosted by the world's richest countries. The reverse is true. The vast majority of refugees, almost 90%, are hosted by the world's poorest countries. And what about Italy? Isn't there a big migration crisis here? Well, that's what you might call a subjective question. And to help you decide what answer you would give, what I thought I'd show was how many people arrived here by boat in the last five years, because that's something that people here seem particularly angry about. You can see that the biggest number arrived in 2016 about 180,000 that year. But that's in the context of an Italian population of 60.5 million people. And now the number of arrivals by sea has dropped to about 33,000. So I think the question isn't really whether there's a migration crisis. I think the better question is maybe whether there's a crisis in how we handle migration. The slide also shows the number of people estimated to die as they cross the sea. And you heard that's been about 20,000 in the last five years. You can see that back in 2016, if you work it out proportionately, it was about one in every 45 who tried the crossing. But by last year, it had risen to one in every 21 people who were trying to cross. That's more than double the number in 2016. And it's the fact that people were undertaking this hugely risky journey and dying and in the process that moved my organization, the Federation of Protestant Churches in Italy, to divert its energy and resources to this project, focusing on the plight of migrants in the Mediterranean region. That was back in 2013. And the project was called Mediterranean Hope. Mediterranean Hope does all sorts of things, and I won't have time to talk about that in, well, each stream in detail tonight, but I'll try and give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of each of the things that we do. 
because I think it tells you something about the different ways that we've responded to this challenge of how we handle migration and also a bit about how our thinking has developed as an organisation. Start with Lampedusa, where we have what we call our migration observatory. Lampedusa, you may know, is a tiny island, just about eight kilometres square. It's about 100 kilometres off the coast of Tunisia. So it's much closer to Africa than it is to the rest of Europe. But by a quirk of history, it happens to belong to Italy. And so, because it's that first bit of European soil, that's where lots of people head to when they're leaving the shores of Africa and trying to find a better life in Europe. The population of Lampedusa is pretty small. It's about 5,000 in permanent terms. So you can imagine how overwhelming it was for people of Lampedusa when hundreds of thousands of people started to arrive there. I was last on Lampedusa back in September, and these are some of the photographs that I took when I was there, just to give you an idea of what it's like. It looks a bit barren in these photographs, but it's actually a very beautiful place. It has award-winning beaches and a turtle sanctuary, but it's not so famous for these things at the moment. It's famous for the number of people who arrive there by boat. And so, our project began back in 2013 by sending two people off to Lampedusa on a kind of exploratory mission to see how we could help, not just the, the people who were coming by boat, but also the local community that was really overwhelmed at the time. And that work has continued to this day. So the team that's there now still is called out day and night when boats arrive to go to the dock to welcome people with cups of tea, with water with a smile and a, and a word of welcome. But um, the work that we're involved in there has changed somewhat over the years as the numbers have changed and tensions have risen. It's not an easy place to be. There's not enough room in the detention center for the people who come. So in the summer, for example, at certain points, 1500 people would arrive in a single weekend. The detention center has room for fewer than 200. And you can imagine how particularly difficult that is at a time when there's a pandemic and social distancing needs to be considered. And that was why, and you'll see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, the government decided that it would charter old cruise ships to be used as quarantine ships moored off the island. And in a way that seems like a logical thing to do. For us though, it's not really very logical because there are half empty reception centers around Italy where people could have been sent to directly to quarantine in much more appropriate conditions and receive treatment because so many people arrive, not just physically scarred, but also psychologically scarred from what we've been through. An important part of the work that's done on Lampedusa is storytelling, collecting data, collecting statistics. This is why we call it the Migration Observatory. It's really an office. But what we're doing is looking at what happens and reporting on it. And up in the right-hand corner there, you can see my colleague Marta talking to some journalists. There's often journalists on Lampedusa reporting what, what's going on. Because we think it's important to tell the truth about what's happened. And we think it's important not just to count the numbers, but tell the stories of the people who arrive. And not forget that these are individual people with lives that they've left behind and experiences that should be shared, that tell us about what's really happening, why people are leaving, and why they're choosing to come to Europe. So that was how we started back in 2013. And for the people that were on Lampedusa welcoming those migrants, it became absolutely clear that what was really needed was support once people got here, because of these terrible experiences that people had suffered. And that was what led to the next step, which was establishing a reception centre on Sicily in Chicri, down in the south. A place where people could be supported, where they wouldn't just have a living accommodation, but also psychological support, language training, education if they were minors, support into work if they were people of age, and help with just navigating the bureaucracy and culture of Italy 
which even for those of us who come in the most benign of circumstances is not easy to do. And so they, we chose this town, this little town in Sicily as the place to put the centre and very deliberately made a choice to put the centre right in the heart of the town. And that wasn't a popular decision. The townspeople did not want a reception centre to be set up there. Our idea was that it would be the best way to help people to integrate. The townspeople were extremely resistant. Thousands of them signed a petition saying that they didn't want the centre to be set up. And it was only thanks to the goodwill of the mayor at the time, who was willing to give it a go, that we were allowed to rent this building with apartments that we could then allow people to live in independently, but share some space as well, that we were able to do that. And so here are some photographs just to give you an idea of, of what it's like there. There's a big common space where people can, if they wish, eat together, share together, play together, be creative, where there can be discussions, where people can talk about what they've been through. And I think one of the things that I'd really like to emphasize is what a wonderful thing has happened in terms of the local community. Because now, instead of being hostile, the townspeople recognize this as their community center. It's become a hub. It's not just for the people who are being hosted in the center itself, who've been through these difficult experiences, but it's a place also where women's groups can meet, where there can be photography exhibitions. Obviously, at the moment, these things are difficult, but in normal times, it's a place to socialize, to interact, to get to know each other. And many of the times people now volunteer at the center as well. Many of them came originally from the local Methodist community, which is part of the Federation of Protestant Churches, but certainly not all of them. And that's something that we're really delighted about because integration is a two-way thing. It's not just about people who arrive. It's about us learning about them, about sharing our cultures together. So we think that the Casa del Culturi has been a bit of a success. At the moment, it's hosting 24 people, seven of them are children. And, you know, they may stay for 18 months or two years, just depending on what their needs are. However, it's not really enough. It's a bit short term. And this was the thing that preoccupied my colleagues in 2013, 2014, at this time when we were deciding what, what, which direction Mediterranean Hope would go in. Because it was clear to, to the group that whilst it's all very well to respond to emergency situations, and that's very important, it's much better to find ways to avert crises if you can. The fact that thousands of people pay people smugglers to send them out to sea on ill-equipped boats, knowing that they might die as they journey, is linked in part at least to the fact that there aren't other options available. So that the question that we were asking ourselves was, could we not find a way to address this? Could we not find a way to open up safe and legal routes, which would enable people to settle safely in Italy? And couldn't we use this experience in Chicli to ensure that once people got here, they would be properly supported, not just with accommodation, but also with, with language training and with education, counselling, cultural and legal information and support into work. Support that would really equip people to become independent. And so that's really how the Humanitarian Corridors programme was born. The concept and the project were developed by us, by the Federation, along with a Catholic organization that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, the Comunità di Sante Gidio. And the third partner in this program is the Waldensian Church, which provides significant funding through the Occupy scheme. And we, all three of us, continue to work together on that project until this day. But I think it's also important to say that the project couldn't function without the support of the fourth partner, which is the Italian government. And whilst there is plenty that I could criticize about migration policy in this country, we have to acknowledge, we should acknowledge that in this respect, Italy has set a wonderful example. Because humanitarian corridors, this mechanism 
brings people safely and legally to Italy from refugee camps in Lebanon. All of the people who come have already been assessed as being in need of international protection. They're all vulnerable asylum seekers. They come on Alitalia flights with their luggage, already cleared by the consulate to travel with the humanitarian visa. And before leaving, they're carefully prepared by our team in Beirut and by professional counsellors, both practically and psychologically, for what awaits them, because it's not easy to move. And on arrival, they are supported either by the Federation or by the Comunità di Sant'Egidio for a period of around 18 months, or if need be, for longer. Long enough to be on the way to settling properly into Italian society. And so here, just you can see in the photographs, this one was taken, um, gosh, January uh, last year, before we had to suspend the programme for the pandemic for a, for a short time just to give you an idea of people arriving at dawn at Fiumicino Airport after this long flight. And really very excited. It's a very emotional thing when, when you welcome these people at the airport. They are so tired and so full of hope. It's a wonderful thing to see. Um, but, you know, the situation in Lebanon is difficult. Not only are most of these people Syrian, many of them refugees who fled war in, in their own country, but then endured pretty difficult conditions in refugee camps in, in Lebanon itself. And Lebanon's not a straightforward place to live in either. As I'm sure many of you know, there were bombs at the port, uh, you know, uh, explosions at the port rather, in August last year. This is our office in Beirut with the windows blown in. Um, it's difficult. These are complicated situations, situations that people need to be taken out of. And part of the work that the team does there is also to, to help with treating people and um, identifying people for our medical hope project, people who are particularly vulnerable and who might be brought to Italy because they need medical treatment here, not just because of their vulnerability as a result of their um, potential refugee status. But I just wanted to quickly tell you the story of um, one of the, the people who's, who's come on the program, this little guy here, he's called Dia. And these days he lives in Pometia. But when he was seven years old, he was living in Homs in Syria at the time when the war was in full swing. And what you may notice, is that Dia only has one leg because, poor boy, when he was out playing football on a piece of waste ground one day, it was bombed and he, he lost his limb. And at that point, his family decided that they had no option but to flee homes where they had tried to stay uh, and go to Lebanon. And there they lived for the next three and a half years until they found out about our programme and applied to be candidates for it. And together, the whole family was brought to Italy and now lives in Pometia, where they have settled. And one of the values of the programme has been not just preparation of the family and the support that they've been given, but also the preparation and support that we were able to offer the community that would receive them. And the school, for example, that Dia would go to, so his classmates, were given some information about Dia and his circumstances before he joined their uh, before he joined the class because it, we all know it's not always easy to welcome a new person, particularly if they've come from a really challenging background. But it's worked really well, and in fact, th this is a lovely picture because it is a picture of of the the class winning a prize for writing about their experiences of welcoming and being welcomed learning about values like solidarity and friendship and each other's cultures. Um, so, you know, it, it's just so heartening to see that programmes like this can, can work. They take a lot of work on, on all sides, but they are so worthwhile. It's such a different experience from the experience of the people who are coming here by boat, that's for sure. The thing is, we would love these projects to go much further. Um, this project has done really well. It has a fantastic reputation globally. We've won prizes for the work that we've done. 
And other governments have started to open humanitarian corridors in France and in Belgium and in Andorra, for example, there are little corridors opening there as well. But we would really like to see this done on a much bigger scale. And that's part of the work that I get involved in, in what we call advocacy work, lobbying, asking governments and policymakers to change things, to improve the way that they handle migration, to think about opening safe and legal pathways for migrants to come instead of just trying to keep people out. And so here in the Rome office, the back office, if you like, is where we do that kind of work, where we're drafting proposals, writing papers, in touch with different organisations so that together we can try and be convincing about the merits of programmes like this and the value of these programmes, not just to the beneficiaries themselves, but also to the communities that they settle in, where we get the benefit of these people with their rich culture and experience in our midst. Am I doing okay for time? Could I say a little bit about one of the other projects or are we short of time? Yes, please, Fiona, if you would, I think that sounds fascinating. Sure. So I just wanted to touch on before we, we finish on, on one of the other projects that we're involved in in Italy, uh, in Calabria. Um, because this is something, you know, just again in the, this ongoing development of what we are as Mediterranean hope and responding to different situations, we turned attention also to the situation of people who are here in Italy already, who may not have arrived by boat and certainly don't have the value of the humanitarian corridors programme beside, behind them, but are here working in Italy, perhaps without papers, and in the process of working here are exploited. So you all know where Calabria is, down in the toe of, of Italy. I'm sure if any of you have been there, you'll know for a fertile region it is. I think it's the second most fertile region in Italy. And it's where, it's the region from which we get most of our citrus fruits, our oranges, lemons, limes, um, and of course many tomatoes and, and so on come from this region. But it also happens to be one of the poorest regions in Italy as well. And the producers of these um, uh, different fruits are entirely reliant on seasonal workers to harvest the produce. And I regret to say that these seasonal workers are in a really terrible situation. They are paid an absolute pittance. They rarely have contracts and the conditions that they live in are shocking. Um, here's some photographs from one of the tent cities uh, at San Ferdinando uh, down in Calabria where our team down there work. And you can see really how awful it is. Um, you know, these guys are, are doing their best to muddle along, but there's no running water, there's no electricity. Um, it's, it's challenging, really hard. And so our team is down there and, and went down there really in the first instance to help them um, to, to try to give them information about rights, to try and lobby for them to have better conditions, to work with the local mayor and um, municipality to improve the situation, to lobby for proper accommodation for these workers, and also to try and improve small things. For example, you can see that this chap has a bike, and you may think, well, big deal. But the reason that the bike is so criti critical is because they work in fields miles away from where they are located places they can't get to using public transport because there is no public transport. And usually the only way of getting to the fields is to give the gang masters who operate them a proportion of the very small wage that they already receive to be taken out to the fields. If they have their own bikes, on the other hand, they can get there under their own steam, but there's no lighting. And so many of them are being run over. And these, you know, it sounds so basic, but it's so important that people should have well-lit roads, should have bikes with lights, should wear reflective clothing, the kind of thing that is beyond the reach of the average migrant worker. But these are the kind of small changes that our team can help with, can help to implement. Um, and so these little projects can make a big difference. When the pandemic struck, the team had to be responsive to that 
because they realised that in the camps that they were working in, a rumour was spreading that COVID was a white man's disease and that the migrant workers didn't need to be worried about it. And of course, we all know now much better than we did before that that, that just absolutely wasn't true. And so the focus changed and became about a campaign of education and information for the people in the camps. We raised money so that we could um, buy hand sanitizer, make hand sanitizer, so that people would have access to it in the camps. The German churches sent money so that we could buy rapid tests and people could be tested who wouldn't otherwise have access to, to testing kits. Such little things, but things that make such a difference when you have absolutely nothing. But whilst we've had to deal with that kind of emergency once again, there's a wider piece of work to be done, which is about shifting the whole way in which this market of people and of produce functions. And so we are working with a cooperative in Rosarno on a fair trade initiative called Etica. And what we're doing is changing the hearts and minds of the producers as well, convincing them that there is value in giving people better conditions, proper contracts, proper pay, and in doing so then being able to access a market that we can open up for them of people who are interested in buying fairly traded products like oranges, lemons, limes, and so forth. And the benefit of that is not just for the workers themselves, but also for the, for the producers. And also because with a tiny proportion of the profit that's made, just one cent in every euro, the money's turned back over to the social projects that we're involved in, for example, the bike lights and so on and so forth. So we are trying in different ways to, to make a difference. Um, and as always being responsive right now, another two of my colleagues are out in Bosnia because we perceive that that's where the next frontier might open up. So it, it's been a bit of a romp through, but I know that the time is, is against us. And really, I guess what I've just wanted to do is give you some understanding of the many and varied things that we can do for and on behalf of migrants. Some of it is definitely about responding to emergencies. Some of it is definitely about trying to improve the lives of people who are here. But a big part of it is also about trying to make changes at a political level too, and trying to make a difference for the future.